Hi everyone. This is going to be the first video in the advanced level biology topic on biochemistry and molecular biology. In this video we're going to be introducing the topic by looking at the general subject of biological polymers and the monomers that make them up. So uh, many of the ideas we're going to go through in this introductory video will be revisited in subsequent videos in this sequence. So for example, we're going to be looking at things like proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and introducing them in terms of the uh, general structure of their polymers and also the monomers that make them up. But there will be later lessons uh, focusing individually on those different kinds of biological macromolecules. So let's start by looking at what we mean when we use the term biological polymer and monomer. So hopefully this is not new to you. Hopefully uh, most of you, if not all of you, will have studied the idea of monomers and polymers and polymerization at GCSE in both chemistry and biology. But biological polymers tend to be very large molecules formed by a combination of many smaller molecules or molecular units that we call monomers. Now the word or the prefix mono comes from uh, the word that means uh, one, whereas the prefix poly means many. So monomers are the individual subunits, the smaller molecules which are chemically bonded together in a repeating manner uh, or pattern to form the larger molecules called polymers. And typically in biological systems, this involves enzymatic catalysis. So enzymes are often involved, uh, which in turn means that typically the polymerization reaction occurs under conditions of optimum pH temperature, uh, with the presence of cofactors and so on. Now, the topic of enzymes will be explored in a separate lesson in this course, uh, in this topic rather, but uh, for the moment it's enough to note that the process of forming polymers from their monomers is typically enzymatically catalyzed in biological systems, and also the reverse process of the catabolism or the breakdown of polymers tends to also be enzymatically controlled. Now, the small molecules, the monomers, are tend to be relatively soluble, things like sugars, amino acids, uh, and so on, and they tend to be easily transportable and are often active participants in cellular metabolism. Now, in contrast, the larger molecules, the polymers, are relatively insoluble, which makes them typically uh, very well suited for things like storage, such as uh, things like starch and glycogen, but also structural uh, uh, uses. So, for example, the polymers cellulose and chitin. Now, biological systems are typically very, very efficient, um, and they tend to be very conservative. Now, the reason uh, for this is that the organic molecules, uh, such as polymers, they require energy to produce or procure. Now, therefore, biochemical pathways have evolved, which make the process of polymerization reversible, and so that polymers can be built up, but they can also be broken down into their monomers, and those monomers can then be transported and repurposed. Now, we're going to be seeing a lot of uh, examples of these ideas in the subsequent lessons where we look at the individual uh, types of biological polymers in a lot more depth. So typically, polymerization involves what we would uh, what we would call a condensation reaction. So we have the monomer, and this is uh, the monomer molecules are chained together; they are linked together chemically uh, by a process. Um, which again typically is enzymatically controlled but is also referred to as a condensation reaction. Now in chemistry the, the term condensation reaction or condensation polymerization uh, usually refers to a process by which a small molecule is removed uh, in the process of chemically bonding two molecules together. Now in biological systems typically that molecule is water. So two monomer molecules will combine in a condensation reaction which results in the formation of a particular kind of chemical bond joining the two molecular units. Now these condensation reactions in biological systems typically result in the elimination of a molecule of water, although in chemistry in a more general sense the, the term uh, condensation reaction can refer to the removal of small molecules such as for example uh, hydrogen chloride when you have the condensation reaction between, uh, for example, an acyl chloride and an, am uh, an amine. But in biological systems, this is typically the removal of water. So the condensation reaction is then repeated, uh, and this extends the size of the polymer molecule until the final polymer molecule is obtained. Now, the notation that we're going to be using here should be familiar to most of you from GCSE. So here, for example, we have square brackets with an N in front of them to specify a, uh, an, um, a large number of monomer subunits. In this case, let's use a nucleotide. So this is the uh, monomer subunit making up nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA. And again, the, the, the number N uh, in this example here 
The, the number n here is being used to describe an unspecified large number of these monomer molecules. Now, uh, if you take, for example, a, a DNA molecule or an RNA molecule, um, DNA and RNA molecules can, can have different sizes, and it depends on the number of monomer units which are being chained together to form them. And so, uh, unlike an ordinary chemical um, symbol, uh, symbol equation, uh, where you have specified numbers uh, which refer to the uh, molar ratios of the reactants and the products in front of the formulae for those reactants and products, typically in an equation that describes polymerization, um, you would not have a specific number of monomer molecules chaining together to form a polymer, because that number can change from one polymerization reaction to the next. But for that particular polymer, it's more about the pattern of the polymerization. So we have an unspecified large number of monomer molecules. In the presence of enzymes and under optimum conditions, these are then linked together in such a way that these monomer molecules are linked to each other by the condensation reaction to form the polymer, in this case a nucleic acid. And to do this, uh, you are removing water molecules between the, pol uh, the monomer molecules to form those linkages. Now, in the case of a nucleotide, as we'll see later on, the linkages formed from one monomer, one nucleotide, and the next are phosphodiester bonds. But in all cases, in biological systems, this involves the removal of water molecules. Now, if the number of monomer molecules being, uh, being chained together is n, then in general, the number of water molecules removed by that condensation reaction will be n minus 1. Now, that's a polymerization reaction, and this happens by means of condensation. Now, the word condensation, again, refers to the removal of a water molecule. But if you're going in the opposite direction, if you're breaking a polymer down back into its monomer subunits, uh, biological catabolism, then you need to add water across those, uh, those bonds linking the monomer subunits in the polymer. And this is referred to as a hydrolysis reaction. Now, the suffix lysis in front of a word in biology typically means breaking or splitting apart. And so hydrolysis literally means splitting apart with water. So to split the bonds between two uh, molecules uh, or monomer subunits, a hydrolysis reaction has to take place, which involves the breaking of that special chemical bond between those two monomer molecules by adding water mole uh, a water molecule across that bond. So we have the polymer, and again, the polymer is made up of N of these uh, an unspecified large number of these individual monomer subunits. You then add n minus 1 water molecules and this will cause all of the monomer subunits to split apart again in the presence of appropriate enzymes and under appropriate conditions and this will form your same number n of the separate um, monomer subunits. So let's have a look at one example of this. Now, carbohydrates uh, are compounds of very, very uh, uh, of great import in biology, in both uh, not just in biology but also in the commercial world as well. They're typically used as a source of energy in all organisms, and also as structural materials in membranes, in cell walls, and also the exoskeletons of arthropods, for example, uh, the example that we referred to before, chitin. So uh, the all of the carbohydrates will contain the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, with the hydrogen and the oxygen being present in a ratio of 2 to 1. And so the general formula of a carbohydrate is this, Cx, and then in brackets H2O, uh, multiplied by Y. So you have uh, X number of uh, carbon atoms, and you have uh, this many hydrogen and oxygen atoms multiplied by the uh, integer Y. So here's an example. So uh, hopefully at this point you all know the, uh, the molecular formula for oxygen and we can see comparing this to the general formula for carbohydrates that in fact it, it does conform to the general formula of carbohydrates. We have uh, x is 6 in this example and we can see here that y is also 6. So this is the structure of linear glucose. Now again, carbohydrates, uh, both their monomers and their polymers, we, is a subject that we're going to be looking at in one of the uh, subsequent lessons of this, of this uh, topic. But uh, for the moment, it's important to know that a molecular formula just gives you the relative numbers of the atoms of each element found in one molecule of that 
uh, of that compound. But the uh, a structural or displayed formula like this one gives you uh, not just that information, but also it gives you an idea of how these atoms are bonded to each other um, in this way. So this is linear glucose here. So monosaccharides are the single sugar units. They are the monomers that form the building blocks for the larger carbohydrates such as starch, uh, glycogen and cellulose, for example. So there are uh, many different monosaccharides and they vary according to uh, the number of carbon atoms that they possess and also uh, the way in which those atoms are arranged in their molecules. Now, glucose is the main source of energy for most organisms and it's uh, referred to as a hexose sugar. Hexose meaning that it has six carbons uh, and it has those six carbons in that formula that you saw before, C6H12O6. So glucose exists as isomers. Uh, the word isomer, again, should be familiar to most of you from chemistry. It means to, uh, when you have two isomers, you have two molecules with the same molecular formula, but different structural formulae. Now, glucose exists in both the straight and the uh, ring forms. <clears throat> now, the ring, forms, uh, the ring form um, uh, occurs when glucose is dissolved in water. So, so uh, most of the cytoplasm of cells tends to be made up of water, and so typically you find the ring form of glucose uh, in the cytoplasm of cells, and it's this form of glucose typically which uh, you find in living organisms. So the ring structure of glucose is usually represented in a manner called a Haworth projection. So this is a Haworth pro projection of the glucose molecule here that you're seeing. Now, this corresponds to a specific three-dimensional structure of this molecule. Now, it's important to understand a little bit about organic chemistry here. Um, when you are drawing a uh, structural formula like this, um, this is a semi-skeletal, semi-structural formula because not all of the carbon atoms are being represented here. So, for example, at these intersections between these individual lines, which represent single covalent bonds, it's assumed that uh, the person viewing this um, uh, this diagram knows that there is a carbon atom here, there's a carbon atom here, there's one here, there's one here, one here, and so on. So this is a Haworth projection. Now, it's important to remember at all times that these types of representations of molecules um, are essentially models, they're diagrams which represent something which occurs in three-dimensional space and may appear very differently from the way the molecule appears here. So for example, um, I can show you a couple of different uh, forms of glucose here that we'll see. So what you're seeing here, if I expand this a little bit, so what you're seeing here is two forms of glucose, alpha glucose and beta glucose. Now these are the uh, semi-skeletal, semi-structural formulae. The wedged filled in lines here um, indicate uh, bonds which are coming out of the page towards you, whereas these dashed lines indicate bonds which are going away from you. So for example, this dashed bond here represents this bond between this carbon and this oxygen atom. And as you can see in this three-dimensional representation here, um, that bond is going into the plane, uh, behind the plane of the screen that you're looking at, as it were. Whereas this bond here, which is uh, not shown in this skeletal projection because, uh, or skeletal model, because skeletal formulae do not show every carbon to hydrogen uh, bond. It only shows the ones which are relevant. And in this case, there's no real reason to show a carbon to hydrogen bond here. And so uh, if, you, if we look at the difference between, um, so here, this bond, uh, rather this bond represents this uh, carbon to oxygen bond here, whereas, and this bond here also represents this carbon to oxygen bond. So you can see here, these two bonds are going backwards towards uh, or away from the plane of the screen that you're viewing. Now, in contrast, if we look at uh, this bond here, for example, this bond here represents this carbon to oxygen bond. And as you can see, in comparison to this one, this one's coming out of the plane of the screen towards you. And similarly, this carbon to oxygen bond here is uh, shown as a wedge shape. And that shows that this bond, which it refers to in this three dimensional model, this ball and stick model is going, is also coming out of the screen towards you. And so as you can see, Unless you're familiar with this type of notation, uh, you wouldn't be necessarily aware that uh, the uh, representations like this actually give you some information about the way that these molecules actually appear in three dimensions. And so 
Um, these ball and stick models are a better way of describing the structures of these molecules because they show uh, not just the which atoms are present uh, and how those atoms are connected, but the relationships of those bonds to each other in three dimensions. Now, there are a number of other ways of representing uh, or making models of molecules uh, in three dimensions. Um, so, for example, um, we could, uh, let's see, So we could, for example, display these as space-filling models, in which case they look very, very different. And so these are the same two molecules, but this is a space-filling model as opposed to a ball-and-stick model. And in this model, you are, you're being shown the surfaces uh, of the outer electron shells of all of the atoms which are bonded to each other. So again, you can see that the uh, formulae, the uh, structural formulae of the two molecules, alpha and beta glucose, haven't changed, but the way they're being represented in three dimensions has, in fact, changed quite drastically, even though they're referring to the same two molecules. So I wanted to just make that point here. When you're looking at diagrams like this, um, don't be uh, fooled into thinking that this is the way that those molecules or those bonds and those atoms are uh, connected to each other and positioned in three dimensions. The way that they're positioned in three dimensions may well be very, very different from the way that the model presents it, but the model does give you some important information about the way that these things are connected to each other. So, uh, in this case, we're looking at glucose. Now, each hexose sugar unit, as, as we saw in those two uh, models, can be uh, can exist in two different forms, two different isomers, the alpha and the beta forms. So here are two Howarth projections of alpha and beta glucose. And so you can see here that these two models uh, look somewhat different from the models that you were seeing here. Um, this is a structural formula. Uh, it's semi-skeletal, semi-structural. Um, these are uh, representing the same two molecules that you see uh, on the screen there. Um, so if I go back to a ball and stick model, so here we have alpha glucose, here we have beta glucose, and this is the way that you would represent them as a Howarth projection. And so this, these wedged lines here indicate that these bonds are being displayed as though they're coming out of the screen towards you. And this gives you some sense of the three-dimensional nature of these bonds. Uh, and so the major difference here between alpha glucose and beta glucose are the relative positions of this hydroxyl group uh, on carbon one uh, and this hydroxyl group. So uh, the uh, hydroxyl group on carbon one in the alpha glucose isomer is below the plane of the six membered ring, whereas the hydroxyl group on the beta glucose is above the plane of the six membered ring. So these isomers can be distinguished by the arrangement of the OH and the H groups about the extreme right carbon, and this is again carbon-1. So simplified views like this um, are often used for representing these molecules, and again these are closer to the semi-structural formulae that you can see here. So uh, glycogen and starch are formed by the condensation reactions between alpha glucose subunits and cellulose is formed by condensation reactions between beta sub, uh, glucose subunits and those condensation reactions uh, produce bonds between those monomer uh, molecules called glycosidic bonds. So. Uh, two alpha glucose subunits, like you see here, undergo a condensation reaction and form a glycosidic bond between the two molecules. And this results in the disaccharide sugar uh, being formed. And this is called maltose. So further condensation reactions can occur um, until the molecule, uh, until you can form a large uh, molecule such as starch. So you can start by forming uh, a disaccharide, the term disaccharide literally means two sugars. And so this is a monosaccharide. This is also a monosaccharide molecule. The condensation reaction between these two monosaccharide subunits forms a disaccharide. Now, uh, if you then go on to polymerize and form condensation reactions between adjacent glucose subunits to the left and the right here, you can then form a polysaccharide such as starch. So this bond here would be referred to as a 1,4 alpha glycosidic bond. And the reason for this is because it's forming between carbon 1 of this molecule over here and carbon number 4 of this molecule here. Now in organic chemistry, typically 
uh, every organic uh, molecule has a uh, what's called a root or a stem, which is the longest continuous chain of carbons in that molecule. In this case, it's this chain here, carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, and carbon 6. The same for this molecule. And so if you're forming a, um, if you're forming a bond between this carbon and this carbon by removing these two hydrogens and this oxygen, in other words, removing a water molecule, the bond that's being formed is between the carbon-1 of this monomer and carbon-4 of this monomer. The bond is called a glycosidic bond, uh, which to organic chemists would be referred to as an ether linkage, a carbon, uh, a, a linkage between two carbons via an oxygen atom. But in biology, this is referred to as a 1,4-alpha glycosidic bond. So uh, again, we're going to be looking at uh, um, carbohydrates in a lot more detail in a subsequent lesson. This is really just laying the groundwork for that. So polysaccharides are the large polymers of the monosaccharides, and due to their relatively large size, they tend to be either insoluble in water or they form colloidal suspensions. Now, the insoluble nature of the polysaccharides makes them particularly suitable as food storage molecules because they have no osmotic effect uh, in the uh, to on the surrounding solution in which you find them. And so in animal and plant cells, typically you will find uh, large uh, polysaccharides such as uh, starch in plants and glycogen in animals forming uh, long-term energy stores. But they can also be used as structural molecules, structural uh, polymers. So for example, the cellulose that you find in plants is a, um, is a polysaccharide. So the principal storage polysaccharides are starch and glycogen. Now starch, which is found in plants, is a polymer of alpha glucose uh, and is in fact a mixture of two different polysaccharides, so amylose and amylopectin. So, uh, you, uh, so the starch molecules that you find uh, are actually rather more complex. So uh, starch is formed of two uh, types of chains uh, of alpha subunits. So amylose uh, is made up of long unbranched chains of alpha glucose and this makes up about 20 to 25 percent of starch by weight and amylopectin is formed of a highly branched polymer of alpha glucose and that makes up the remainder of starch by weight. So amylose is formed by a series of condensation reactions that bond the alpha glucose molecules together into a long chain forming many glycosidic bonds like these. Now the amylose chain once formed will then coil into a helix like you're seeing here. <clears throat> So let's have a look at the structure of amylopectin. Now this consists of a, a straight chain of alpha glucose units with branch points occurring approximately every 12th glucose unit along the straight chain. So the branch points form when carbon-6 of a straight chain glucose molecule forms a glycosidic bond with carbon-1 of a glucose molecule positioned above the chain. And so this would be referred to as a 1,6 alpha glycosidic bond. Now, this highly branched uh, amylopectin molecule is then wrapped around the amylose to make the final starch molecule. So as you can see here, this is more of a kind of graphic representation where you have these branched molecules, these branched polysaccharide molecules. Each one of these little red uh, subunits uh, is a glucose monosaccharide monomer. So this large mole uh, molecule is uh, insoluble. It doesn't dissolve particularly well in water at all. And it has branch points that allow easy access for enzymes when you're breaking down this molecule to release those individual glucose subunits for the purposes of respiration and other uh, metabolic um, uses. And so as such, it, it, it represents a very dense store of individual glucose subunits, which is very easily and quickly and efficiently broken down into the individual glucose subunits, which can then be used for metabolism. So let's have a look at glycogen then. Now glycogen is often referred to as animal starch because it uh, serves the same function as starch but in animals. Now glycogen has the same overall structure as amylopectin but has significantly more branching uh, than amylopectin. So what we have here is more of these branch points um, in the chains of glucose molecules. <clears throat> 
So enzymes such as amylase and maltase can catalyze the hydrolysis of glycosidic bonds. And so we're looking here at an example of what we mentioned before, a reaction where an, uh, a water molecule is being added across one of the bonds that was formed in the formation of a polymer and uh, thereby breaking that bond. So what we see here is a 1,4 alpha glycosidic bond. And so when we add water across that bond, in a hydrolysis reaction, this breaks the glycosidic bond and releases the two alpha glucose subunits, which were originally polymerized together um, in the condensation reaction that we saw before. And so essentially what we're doing here is we are undoing, we are reversing that condensation reaction to release the two individual uh, monomer molecules. And so glucose molecules are easily absorbed and then transported throughout an organism. And this is important because typically uh, glucose molecules would then be used um, for the purposes of metabolism, for respiration. So in humans, glucose tends to be stored as a polysaccharide called glycogen in large amounts, in typically um, mainly in, gluco in the um, liver and in muscle tissue. Now, glycogen is composed of shorter chains with more branch points than amylopectin, and this makes it more readily hydrolyzed uh, back into those alpha-glucose subunits. Now, this is, this is particularly important in animals because they have a much greater metabolic requirement. They have a much rate, uh, greater rate of uh, energy um, uh, or, or, or rather their muscles and their nervous systems and various other uh, parts of their bodies typically have a much higher metabolic requirement. They have a much higher energy requirement. And so it's important that this storage molecule that contains the glucose required for uh, respiration and metabolism, um, that storage molecule needs to be readily broken down quickly to form large amounts of available glucose. So we've had a quick look at, um, uh, at um, carbohydrates. So let's now have a look at another class of biological macromolecules and their, and their monomers. So we're gonna look at proteins. And again, there's going to be a separate lesson on this later in this topic. Now, amino acids are the monomers of proteins and proteins are intimately connected with all phases of chemical and physical activities of living cells. Now, proteins uh, function, among other things, as enzymes, hormones, antibodies, oxygen transporters, and they also form the bulk of the structural elements of things like skin, feathers, hair, nails, and cartilage. Now, the, gen the uh, general structure of the monomer that makes up, uh, monomers that make up proteins is shown here. You have a central carbon, sometimes referred to as an alpha carbon. That carbon is bonded by single uh, covalent bonds arranged in a tetrahedral arrangement to the following groups. So on one side, you have an amine group, which biologists re will refer to as an amino group. Uh, and on the other side, you have a carboxylic acid group. And sometimes this is referred to as a carboxyl group. Now the alpha carbon will have a hydrogen. And so all amino acids have this general structure, but the way that the 20 or so naturally occurring amino acids differ from each other, uh, and also the other amino acids, which can be artificially made, are by means of this variable group called an R group. So all of the amino acids found in living organisms uh, have an amine group, they have a carboxyl group, they have an alpha carbon to which those are linked, and the alpha carbon has a hydrogen on it, but the R group is a variable group. And so again, this is a displayed formula in the sense that it shows all of the available groups except for the variable R group. So I suppose you could call it a structural formula. Um, but just to, again, to give you a sense of how this appears, uh, let's have a look at how this actually looks in terms of the general structure. So here we see uh, glycine, the simplest amino acid. And so what we have here is the amino group, NH2, a nitrogen atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms. This is bonded via a single uh, a nitrogen to carbon covalent bond to the alpha carbon. The alpha carbon, in the case of glycine, which is the simplest amino acid, has a hydrogen, and the R group, the variable group, is simply a hydrogen atom. On the other side, you have the uh, car uh, the, carboxylate, uh, the carboxyl group here, so you have the carbon double bonded to an oxygen and also bonded to a uh, uh, hydroxyl group here, an oxygen and a hydrogen. And so this is the general structure of um, glycine, and the only thing that differs between this and the other amino acids is that the other amino acids have something other than a hydrogen as the variable group. And so to give you an example, 
This one here is arginine. Now it looks at first like a very, very different molecule, but if we have a look at the structure here, we can see here that it has an amino group, which is this group over here. It also has a carboxyl group, which is this group over here. It has the alpha carbon, which has this hydrogen here, but in the case of arginine, it has a rather large variable group, which is made up of a chain of three carbon atoms, followed by a nitrogen, followed by a carbon, uh, which is bonded to an amine group, and also a uh, double bonded to a nitrogen, which has a single hydrogen here. And so this is the R group. This whole region of the molecule here is the R group for arginine. But as you can see, in every other respect, it has the same general structure as other amino acids. And so again, we can see that the structural formulae that you might uh, represent these molecules with on a piece of paper gives you some idea as to their structure. So for example, you can see here that the main carbon chain is made up of individual uh, carbon to carbon bonds which are arranged in this kind of um, uh, at these tetrahedral angles um, here. But when you represent it like this, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the fact that you're dealing with a three-dimensional molecule. And so uh, if, if at all possible, and I'm sure you've, uh, many of you have done this in your uh, lessons at school, uh, you will have assembled molecular models like these uh, to give you a sense of how these things appear in three dimensions. But again, all amino acids have the, general, the same general structure. They all have a carboxyl group, they all have an amine group. The carboxyl and the amine group are singly covalently bonded to the alpha carbon, which has a single hydrogen and then some variable group, which differs from one amino acid to the next. So protein molecules are made up of uh, many different amino acids, uh, monomers, the individual building blocks, and these are linked together. And again, this is done by means of condensation reactions. So if you take two individual amino acids and link them together by means of a condensation reaction, you get what's called a dipeptide. And this is in the same way that when you start with two individual monosaccharide subunits and link them together by a condensation reaction, you end up with a disaccharide. And so again, the prefix di here means two or two units. So this diagram illustrates that in a kind of diagrammatic way. We have an amino acid uh, with its R group, its variable group, and so this box here, which is the same between these two amino acids, indicates the part of the molecule which is common to all amino acids. Again, that is the uh, carboxyl group, the alpha carbon, and the amine group, and the hydrogen on the alpha carbon. All of that is common to all amino acids. The only way that amino acids differ from each other is in the variable group. This is glycine, where the variable group is just a hydrogen. Again, this is arginine, where the variable group, as you can see, is much more complex and contains many other atoms. So the variable groups are different. You link these together. In this case, this is called a peptide bond, and this is a bond that organic chemists who perhaps aren't biologists would call an amide linkage or an amide bond. But in biology, it's referred to as a peptide bond, and the molecule that you form is called a dipeptide. And this is done by means of the removal of a single water molecule from between these two amino acids. So, uh, in the same way as you form a, a peptide link between two amino acids to form a dipeptide, you can then get another amino acid and link it to either end of this and continue with those condensation reactions to form uh, a much larger uh, polymer. You can start by linking an additional amino acid to form a tripeptide and then continue to link these amino acids together to form a polypeptide. And the polypeptide ultimately will fold up and coil up and twist up into a functional protein. Now again, there will be another uh, lesson on the subject of uh, proteins and their structure in a lot more detail later on in this topic. So two amino acids can join together by a condensation reaction, and this is how it happens. So you start with the two amino acids. Now, the way that it works is that the amino end of one amino acid will form a bond with the carboxyl end of the adjacent amino acid by the removal of a water molecule. It's the removal of a hydrogen atom from the amino group of one amino acid and the removal of the hydroxyl part of the carboxylic acid functional group from the uh, adjacent amino acid. So we remove water, this is a condensation reaction, and we form this linkage here. This linkage, uh, this group of atoms here, is referred to by uh, uh, biologists as a peptide bond. And we did this by removing a water molecule, and so the water molecule is removed here. Now, 
there are about 20 different naturally occurring amino acids uh, which can be combined in any order, theoretically. And so the potential number of polypeptides and proteins that you can form, uh, which are the polymers of, of amino acids, is obviously a very, very large number of different um, potential polypeptides. There are uh, a very, very large number of potential ways that you can combine the 20 um, naturally occurring amino acids in this linear order. And it's for this reason that there are so many different kinds of proteins. Now, as we'll see in the lesson on protein structure and function, um, it's not just the linear sequence of amino acids. That linear sequence then coils up and folds up into secondary structural motifs like these alpha helices and beta sheets and beta barrels. Those secondary structural motifs will then fold and associate with each other further to form the three-dimensional or tertiary structure or globular structure of a protein. This is a P13 protein given as an example. And then some proteins can form complexes with other protein molecules to form what's called quaternary structures. And so an example here are the four protein subunits of hemoglobin. So the special bond formed between the monomers of amino acids is called the peptide bond. But just like we saw with carbohydrates, you can form polymers of amino acids by condensation reactions, but you can also, um, you can also cause those amino acids to be split from each other by the opposite type of reaction, the hydrolysis reaction. So here we can see a linear protein chain, uh, a linear polypeptide. The individual blue spheres here represent the individual amino acids, all linked by peptide bonds. Now, the protein can then be broken apart by enzymes called endopeptidases, such as pepsin, which is found in the stomach, uh, trypsin and chymotrypsin, which are the pancreatic protease enzymes. And these catalyze the breaking of, uh, of, um, of peptide bonds uh, within that polypeptide chain, in the middle of that polypeptide chain, rather than cleaving them from the ends here. And hence uh, the term endopeptidases. The prefix endo typically in biology means within. And so this results in the breaking up of the protein molecule into smaller sequences of amino acids, which are themselves quite long, and so they're still called polypeptides. And then you get exopeptidases, um, which can be car carboxypeptidases, which break the um, peptide bonds from the carboxylic acid end of the polypeptide, uh, or you can have aminopeptidases, which break the peptide bonds from the amino end of a polypeptide molecule. In, in either case, these are, these are enzymes which are distinct from the endopeptidases in that they break bonds at the extreme ends of a polypeptide. And so examples of carboxypeptidases are things like pancreatic enzyme, and also, you have brush border enzymes, which are amino peptidases. And again, this, these catalyze the breaking up of these peptide bonds to release smaller di and tripeptides, and ultimately, the brush border enzymes, dipeptidases and tripeptidases, will break down the remaining peptide bonds in the dipeptides and the tripeptides to release the individual amino acids. Now, again, we'll be looking at um, both protein structure and also digestive enzymes in separate lessons within the advanced level biology course. Um, there will be a, a specific lesson in the uh, transport and uh, exchange topic, which deals with uh, chemical digestion, where we look at these enzymes in a lot more detail. There will be a, a lesson on protein structure within this topic, where we look at protein structure in more detail. And there'll also be um, a lesson in this topic on enzymes and the functioning of enzymes, where we look at that in a lot more detail as well. So when we're breaking a peptide bond, essentially we are removing uh, or rather we are adding water across the peptide bond to reform those original two functional groups on the separate amino acids. So we are adding a hydrogen atom to this nitrogen atom, we're breaking this bond, and we're adding a carboxyl group to this uh, carbonyl carbon to form, respectively, the amino group on this amino acid and the carboxyl group on this amino acid here. And so the peptide bond is broken by means of a hydrolysis reaction. So let's have a look now at the third, a third class of uh, biological macromolecules, the, uh, the nucleic acids. Now, things like DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid, uh, and RNA, these are a class of biological macromolecules which are 
uh, associated with heredity, with the encoding of inheritable structural information. And so DNA is the molecule of heredity, and RNA is the molecule which helps express the genetic code into functional proteins. Now, both of these are polymers of nucleotides, which are the monomers. Now, all nucleotides have a common structure, and there are five common ones found in nature. Each nucleotide consists of a five-carbon sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen-containing organic base. And so this diagram that we saw earlier uh, illustrates the general structure of a single nucleotide. So here we have the phosphate group. This is bonded to a five-carbon uh, sugar, a pentose sugar, and this is bond, uh, bonded to a nitrogenous base. So we have generally uh, four different nucleotides that are found in DNA. We have uh, one of these nucleotides is exchanged for a different nucleotide, so this is thymine. This is found in DNA, but it's uracil, which is found in RNA, and so these are the four different nucleotides or monomers that form the building blocks of DNA. And they're all the same as far as the phosphate group and the ribose sugar are concerned. The way in which they differ is in the uh, organic nitrogenous base, which is bonded to the ribose sugar. So adenine and guanine, which are given the symbols A and G respectiv uh, respect respectively, uh, these belong to a group of organic bases called purines. And the two other ones, thymine and cytosine, these belong to a group of organic bases called pyrimidines. And so A and G, adenine and guanine, these are purines. And uh, thymine and cytosine are referred to as pyrimidines. Now, the way in which these are polymerized, the way that these are linked together to form DNA and RNA is by means of a bond formed by co condensation reactions called the phosphodiester bond. Now the phosphodiester bond can be thought of as the key to most life on Earth because it's a major component in the backbone of a strand of DNA or RNA. And DNA is common to all living organisms. It is the molecule which stores the genetic information for all organisms, regardless of domain, of kingdom, of phylum, of class, or any other means of classification. It is common to all organisms. So what we have here is two uh, monomer subunits of DNA. We have adenine, uh, an adenine-containing nucleotide here. We have a cytosine-containing nucleotide here. And the way that they're bonded is by means of a condensation reaction that links this carbon of the pentose sugar to the phosphate group of the adjacent nucleotide. And this is done by the removal of a water molecule. Now, the bond that's formed uh, is referred to as a phosphodiester bond, and it consists of two strong covalent ester bonds either side of the phosphate, which forms the bridge uh, between the two pentose sugars. Now, in DNA and RNA, the phosphodiester bond is the linkage between the three prime carbon atom of one sugar molecule and the five prime carbon atom of another. Uh, deoxyribose in DNA is the uh, pentose sugar found in DNA, whereas ribose is the pentose sugar found in RNA. So this diagram, um, you can see here where the water molecule which is removed actually comes from because this diagram gives you a bit more structural information uh, about the both the pentose sugar, the ribose, and also the phosphate group. So uh, phosphate group, when it's bonded to a carbon here, exists in this form. And you have here a five-membered ring. Uh, so it's uh, a pentose sugar in the sense that this is carbon one, this is carbon two, this is carbon three, this is carbon-4, and this is carbon-5. And so these carbons, when they are involved in a bond here, they're referred to as the three prime carbon, a three with a little apostrophe next to it, and the five prime carbon. And so what we see here is a bond being formed between the three prime carbon on this nucleotide, uh, or on this ribose sugar, on this deoxyribose sugar, and the five prime uh, carbon uh, on this uh pentose sugar on this nucleotide via the, phosph phosph uh, the phosphate group on this nucleotide. And so what we've done here is we, we already have a bond between the fifth carbon of this pentose sugar and the phosphate group that it's linked to. But to form a bond between these two nucleotides, this nucleotide here and this nucleotide here, we are removing a hydrogen atom from this hydroxyl group on this three prime carbon and the whole hydroxyl group from the phosphate 
group on this nucleotide here. By doing that, we formed uh, this covalent bond here. And so the, 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 the phosphodiester bond is this whole arrangement between this three prime carbon and this five prime carbon. All of these bonds, so it's a it's called a phosphodiester linkage because an ester linkage uh, would be between two carbons, but instead what we have here is a phosphate group linking one carbon to another on the other side. So this is called the phosphodiester bond, and this is what forms what's referred to as the backbone uh, on DNA and RNA molecules. So nucleotides, uh, nucleotides are the monomers that form these uh, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. So these form strong covalent phosphodiester bonds with each other when the sugar group of one nucleotide bonds uh, by condensation with the phosphate group of an adjacent nucleotide. And so this is how the chains of nucleotides are formed. And so uh, here we can see the strong covalent phosphate uh, phosphodiester bonds which hold the polynucleotide, the polymer, together. Now, in order to form a molecule of DNA, a DNA molecule actually has two such so-called sugar phosphate backbones with a sequence of nucleotides which form pairs with each other. And so the second polynucleotide chain is formed on the other side, but it runs in the opposite direction to the first. So something like this. So the nucleotides, the nucleotides are linked with strong covalent bonds between each other. However, the the two backbones, if you like, are not connected to each other via covalent chemical bonds. Instead, you have hydrogen bonding, which is a form of intermolecular bonding or physical bonding between the adjacent. Uh, nucleotides and or rather the adjacent nit nitrogenous uh, bases of the adjacent nucleotides and so the nucleotides have strong covalent bonds between each other but there are relatively weaker hydrogen bonds between the base pairs and it's these hydrogen bonds between the base pairs which hold the two polynucleotide strands to each other and so the whole molecule then coils itself into a double helix structure like this so DNA consists of two polynucleotide strands, two polymer strands, and the backbone of each one of those strands is the sugar phosphate arrangement, which is connected uh, between nucleotides by phosphodiester bonds, which are strong covalent chemical bonds. And so the whole um, assembly, the whole poly uh, double polynucleotide molecule, then twists and coils itself into a double helix. And so again, we have adenine bonding with thymine by, via two hydrogen bonds, guanine bonds with cytosine via three hydrogen bonds. Now, as in DNA, phosphodiester bonds are formed in RNA when two nucleotides combine in a condensation reaction. And again, this involves the elimination of water. Now, the pento sugar in RNA is ribose. And again, it was deoxyribose in DNA. And so in RNA, it's a very similar form of reaction. You have a bond being formed, which is called a phosphodiester bond. And the way that it works in RNA is very, very similar to the way that it works in DNA. The only real difference here is the fact that you are not dealing with deoxyribose, you're dealing with ribose as the pentose sugar. So once again, the special bond that's being formed here is the phosphodiester bond. And so again, we're going to revisit nucleic acids in a later lesson in this sequence. So here's a little bit of an extension uh, activity or rather uh, some information that should extend your understanding beyond your uh, advanced level specification. Um, now, the reason I do this is because advanced level specs are typically um, a little bit more open ended than GCSE specifications. So in other words, um, if you're aiming for the very highest grades at advanced level, it's not enough to simply learn everything that you find in your A-level revision guide from your exam board or everything that you perhaps come across in the spec. Um, it's necessary to go uh, a little bit beyond the spec in terms of the depth of understanding and also the breadth of understanding as well. So I'm offering this information to you to help you uh, attain those very highest grades, particularly uh, for those of you who have um, uh, essay questions to write in exams.
So chitin is a structural polymer, which we measured before. It's the main structural component in the exoskeleton of insects and crustaceans, but it's also the fabric of fungal cell walls as well. It's also found in the radulae, uh, radulae of mollusks and also the beaks and internal shells of cephalopod mollusks, uh, mollusks such as squids and octopi. So chitin is a linear polymer of, of a monomer called N-acetyl glucosamine, and uh, this is a derivative of glucose. So here we can see the Howarth projection of N-acetyl glucosamine. And uh, it's found, as I say, as the monomer of this polymer called chitin. And chitin is found in, as you can see here, a very wide variety of uh, very disparate, very unrelated, seemingly evolutionarily unrelated organisms. So... Here we can see uh, that it forms the exoskeleton of insects as well as crustaceans like crabs and lobsters, uh, but also in other organisms such as mollusks as well. So uh, here we can see the fabric of fungal cell walls. Uh, these are the hyphae of uh, fungi. And here we can see that it forms uh, the uh, radulae of mollusks and the jaws or beaks and internal shells of cephalopod mollusks, such as the squid and the octopus here as well. Okay, everyone, well, that's going to do it for today's lesson. I hope that was useful to you, and I will see you in the next lesson. Take care.